The lectionary has focused on Galatians over the next six weeks. And so what I did is I tweaked the lectionary a little bit, which I, I'm known to do from time to time. And what I've done is I want to present uh, the entire book of Galatians for us over these next six weeks. So each week we'll look at a separate chapter as we look at this important letter and how it relates to our own understanding of justification of faith and how Paul presents that. Galatians is one of the uh, most important letters of Paul, as most scholars will agree. And so as we look at that, we'll see that there is a conflict in Galatia. Paul has established these churches in this region. This is what would be modern-day Turkey now, the uh, lower part of, below the Black Sea. And uh, in that time, there are these churches of Galatia. And he, he preached to these people and converted many and started uh, the early church there in Galatia. Now, in Jerusalem, they had some other Christians who believed and saw things a little bit differently than Paul did. And they came to these churches and they told them, you're doing it wrong. You don't quite have it right. And so they, they were sharing a little bit different way of being Christian. And Paul writes this letter to the churches in response of that visit. Uh, so as we hear the letter today, it's going to lift up the name Cephas. And I just want you to know, for those who don't know, Cephas is, means the disciple Peter. Uh, and then it's going to lift this James, the brother of our Lord. And that uh, James is the brother of Jesus. He was not a disciple. Uh, James was called James the Just sometimes. And he was actually the head of the church in Jerusalem until about 62 AD when he was martyred. And so... Uh, just so you know who those people are, it's important for us to know as we hear this gospel. I invite you to hear chapter 1 this morning. Paul, an apostle, sent neither by human commission nor from human authorities, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the members of God's family who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to set us free from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to what we proclaim to you, let that one be accursed. As we have said before, so now I repeat, if anyone proclaims to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let that one be accursed. Am I now seeking human approval or God's approval? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still pleasing people, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. You have heard, no doubt, of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently persecuting the church of God and was trying to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many among my people of the same age, for I was far more zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who had set me apart before I was born and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles, I did not confer with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me. But I went away at once into Arabia, and afterwards I returned to Damascus. Then after three years I did go up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and stayed with him fifteen days. But I did not see any other apostle except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard it said, the one who was formerly, the one who formerly was persecuting us is now proclaiming the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. O oh, good and gracious God, as we have gathered here as your people and heard your word proclaimed through the Apostle Paul, we know that he preached grace to your church in the very beginning. And today he still preaches grace to your church here today. 
And so we ask that you give us ears to hear and eyes to see, a mind to comprehend this grace available to us in Christ Jesus. It is in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Well, Paul really uh, starts out nicely, you know, with a nice prayer and blessing. And then he just kind of starts out and just lets them have it. I mean, just right off the bat, he says, if there's another gospel that's being proclaimed, let that one be accursed. And then he kind of sets out his own authority, what this is under. He said, it's not about what I've received from other people, but it's what I've received from God. And so this was a re revelation of Jesus Christ to the Apostle Paul. And he says, I'm going to preach it no matter what. And he says, I don't care if an angel comes and preaches something different. He said, that one should be accursed. I mean, this is strong language that he's kind of setting out. It's almost like he's mad about this because he believes so deeply in the grace of Jesus Christ that we see in the life and suffering and death and resurrection of Jesus. And so what we have is these other Christians who are also deeply faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ coming and saying, no, but this is what's important for salvation. And so what we're getting at is an age-old argument about what is essential to faith for salvation. What is it? I mean, we still bicker about that with other churches and things like that. We bicker amongst ourselves about what are the essentials. And so it's nothing new. We don't have to be scared about that. We see from the very beginnings that the early church struggled with this and found faith to thrive and survive and do well and share the gospel of Jesus around the world. And so we can surely take from this examples for ourselves and thrive in our own faith as disciples of Jesus Christ today. So as we think about what are the essentials of salvation, what is important for us, important belief that we all have is that we should somehow be transformed in the faith. And that's important, that somehow our faith in Jesus Christ makes us different people, and we don't just live the lives we lived after before we received faith in Christ. And so having some kind of change is important. Billy Graham was uh, one of the most influential uh, Christians in the 20th century, and he had these great crusades all around the United States and had these stadiums full of people and they would have people, altar calls in those times, and they would pray the same prayer with all the people who came forward. And it was the sinner's prayer, and I'm going to read it to you. Uh, people say I should probably know the sinner's prayer better than I do. Uh, but I wanted to read the exact one that they used at the Billy Graham crusade, just so you hear it. They'd pray this with people. It said, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In your name, amen. And they would pray for that prayer with people so that they would have some kind of sense of partnering with God in this, receiving the grace, receiving forgiveness for sins, but also repenting and wanting to live a changed life. That's pretty common with most of Christianity. In our Wesleyan understanding, when we have our vows of Christian discipleship, when people profess their faith in Jesus Christ, we ask this first. We say, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? So we all have this understanding of kind of co-creating with God and, and saying that I'm going to be better than I am now, and I'm going to move forward and be something new. As Wesleyans, we say well, that's a part of sanctification after justification. We say we're being sanctified in the faith of Jesus Christ, making ourselves more Christ-like. So as we look back on Paul's time, and they talked about essentials, and talked about what is that essential thing, what Paul was trying to do is to say that what we don't want to do is confuse ourselves to imagine that we have somehow earned the salvation through the law. And we still get that trouble today. We, we imagine somehow that we have earned our salvation, that we have do these works and do these things as a Christian, somehow that will make us better in God's eye, more acceptable. And that's what Paul says, that's not it at all. God finds you acceptable now. And our response is to live out of the grace that we have received. It's very different from what the church in Judea was preaching. And they would say, 
You know, for them, circumcision was a big deal. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, it means that you are to be circumcised. And for all these uh, Mediterranean Christians who had never been circumcised, it's one thing to be circumcised as a baby when you don't have any say in it. But as an adult, I mean, come on. They're going to say, forget it. A lot of folks, the women probably said, we don't care. But <laughs> that's your men's problem. But the men would be like, well, I don't know about that. And so Paul says, you know what? Circumcision is not essential to faith in Christ. Now, others would say, well, what about the diet? And we have these dietary laws. We, we, we don't eat certain things, and we do eat certain things, and that's important, and that's essential to our salvation as Christians, followers of Jesus. And you know what Paul says? You know what? Not essential. They even went so far as to say, when you are in these pagan areas that have these temples and these other gods and goddesses, and they bring in an animal and sacrifice it ritually on the altar for that god or goddess in worship, and then they sell the meat, that they, part of that animal, in the marketplace, and if you eat of that meat that was part of that ritual, you are costing yourself salvation. And you know what Paul said? He, he looked at that practice and said, you know what? Not essential. <laughs> he said, you can eat the meat. It's okay if you really want to eat it. If you have strong faith in Christ, just don't let it bother someone who finds it troublesome. And so we have this sense of law and this struggling up against the law. And Paul had practiced the law all his life. And so what he's trying to say is that when we are having the grace of Jesus Christ in our lives, it's not something we earn, but it is something that changes us. Now, I think Jesus tells a parable about this that really kind of gets to the heart of the matter. It's one of the great ones. It's the parable of the vineyards. I like to tell it because it really steps on people's toes. But on my own included, because when I tell it, I don't know, it, it makes me squirm a little bit. You know the story. Jesus uh, told this story about an owner of a vineyard who went to the marketplace to hire workers to work in his vineyard that day. He went early in the morning, hired a bunch, went back, said, I'm going to pay you what's right. Day's wage is great. And they start to work. He goes back at 9 a.m., you know, for the people that slept a little bit later that day, and uh, hires some more, takes them out. Says, I'll pay you what's right. You're going to work for me. We go back. He goes back at noon. Now, I don't know who's sleeping at noon back in that day, but some did, and they were there and ready to work. And he hires them and takes them back out. He goes back out at 3 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, maybe they worked earlier jobs that day. I don't know, but he's going to hire them, and they, they go back out. He goes back out one more time, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, one hour before quitting time. He goes back out, finds some other people, brings them back in, takes them to the vineyard. They work. Now it's quitting time. And he lines them all up to pay. And he starts with the people who only worked an hour, and he pays them a whole day's wage. Well, you can imagine the others who worked all day are thinking, woo jackpot, you know, we're going to get paid a lot. But he went down and paid the same amount to every single person, including the people who worked all day long. Now, if you're one of the ones who worked all day, and you saw somebody working an hour and get paid the same as you, what would you say? Would you like it? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. It'd make you mad, wouldn't it? I'd be mad. That's exactly right. We'd all be upset. And that's what the parable shows. They start to grumble at the owner, and they say, and this is the important word that says, you have made them equal to us who have borne the scorching sun in the heat of the day. You hear that word? You have made them equal to us. And the owner says, look, it's my money. Are you, are you upset because I'm generous with these others? Can I do with my money what I want to do with it? And that's it. That's the parable. Does it make you squirm a little to hear it? I do. I squirm just listening to it. Let me say, this is not a good business practice. <laughs> That's not why he told it. He didn't tell it to be, uh, you know, you think, why did Jesus tell this awful story, you know, to us, to hear this? Why did he tell it, church? It's to understand that grace is nothing we earn. That grace is given freely by God. It's a gift. It's difficult for us to kind of put that into action 
as a church. And yet that's what Paul seems to be saying to the churches at Galatia and to us today is that, look, this is the gospel. Take it or leave it. This is it. Can you understand it? There's a little church in Oklahoma, a uh, small town in Oklahoma, uh, years ago. And this little church was thriving in ministry and, and doing well. And, and they had a good congregation. It was, had a lot of people in town, a good mix of ages. And they had one family that was very generous and kind of well off in town. And they gave a little over half the whole budget throughout the year. And so they're doing fine, but this family kind of let other folks know that they gave. You know, they, they wouldn't actually say how much, but they just kind of dropped little hints in conversations where it kind of elevated people's ideas about them. They're like, well, they must really give a lot. And some people thought they must give like 80% of the whole church budget. You know, they had it elevated in their minds that it was a huge amount. But it was still a good amount. I do want to say, if, if, they, if they gave the entire budget, they never would have missed it out of their living or their lifestyle. They could have done it and never would have missed it. They wouldn't have driven any different cars, gone on any different vacations, had a different house or anything like that. They would have been just fine. But they gave a little over half, which was good. So as, as you think about and consider the kind of authority that that person had or that family had in that church, it was, it was pretty big because people looked at them and thought, well, we don't want to anger them. And every once in a while, they would say things that kind of keep people on the edge. They'd say things like, well, you know, we were having uh, dinner at Sonic with uh, Jim, Bob, and Susie Q the other night, and, uh, you know, they go to the church across town, and, boy, they were talking about inviting us to their church, and they said they'd love to have us at their church. They've got a good church over there. Now, they wouldn't, they wouldn't go anywhere, but they just kind of drop that, you know, once in a while, say that kind of thing. So you think, oh, you know, we want to, don't want to make them mad, don't want to send them down the road. Well, things were fine until vacation Bible school happened. VBS can be dangerous. <laughs> you never know about VBS. VBS happened in their church because they invite everybody at VBS. Everybody gets to come to VBS, and they invited all the kids in, and this, this one kid started coming, and they enjoyed it so much they came back to Sunday school because they loved their teacher so much at VBS. And they came to Sunday school, and they liked that, and they kept coming. And once in a while, their parents would show up, and that's when the problems began because the dad was a known alcoholic in town. And back in those days, he had been known as the town drunk. He went and worked at different farms around the community, and he'd work at a farm for a while, and he was a good worker when he was sober, and he would do well at the job until he went on a bender and get drunk, and then he wouldn't come to work. and wouldn't show up for several days. So then he'd come back, and he'd get fired, and he'd go on to the next farm. And when they started coming to church, some people worried. They said, well, he's just coming now because he, he wants us to soften up on him and hire him back. And others said, well, no, they're just coming. They should be able to come if they want to come. And they were coming for a while, and they decided they wanted to join the church. And in this church, whenever somebody wanted to join, uh, it was the quaint custom, kind of awful custom, where they had a church council meeting to decide. They'd vote on whether or not you could become a member. Now, that is not in the discipline it's, the discipline says it's up to the pastor in the United Methodist Church on who can join or not. But this church said, we're ignoring the discipline, and it's church council. It's how he's always done it. And that's how they did it. And so they, they got their council together, and they're going to vote on whether or not this family could come in. And about half the congregation in the council said, you know, grace is open to all, and anybody that wants to be a member of our church should be able to come in and become a member of the church. And the other half were saying, well, yeah, that's true. But, you know, when you become a member... Repent, and repentance is a big part of it, and you've got to show that you're working on your life in Christ and doing better. And so, you know, if he's still getting drunk all the time, is he really repenting? So, well, you got a point there. So they went back and forth on this, and finally they turned to Mr. Budget, you know, the authority, and they said, what do you think? And he thought for a minute and kind of paused, and well, you know, I kind of side with that idea that he ought to be sober. And he said, tell you what, if he's sober for a year and can show us that he's changed his life in Christ and they still want to join the church, we can have another council meeting in a year and then we can decide. And so then some of the folks that were all for including him, they said, well, maybe he's got something there. And they changed their votes and that's what they did. They said, you got to wait. But the council didn't tell the family. They made the pastor do it. <laughs> and well, the family quit coming 
church. And pretty soon, he ran out of farms he could work at, and then he moved on down the road and went somewhere else. Today, that church is on life support. It's a second church of a two-point charge. And the family that had all the influence in that church finally followed through on their threat, and they moved on down the road to another church. What does it mean for the essentials of salvation? What does it mean to understand grace in our lives where we understand it and we can not only understand it, but project it to the world? How do we share that grace as the people of God to say, this is who we're going to be. Come hell or high water, we're going to love each other. It's hard. And it steps on our toes. And yet that's what Paul seems to be telling us today. You know, Tom Hanks has a new movie out, uh, Hologram of a King, I think so. I haven't seen it yet, but I hear it's good. All, I like all Tom Hanks movies. He's one of the you know, most beloved actors of our times. And in this movie, he plays a guy who's a businessman who's got this deal going on in Saudi Arabia where he can just deal of a lifetime kind of thing. And this movie kind of has this point where you get in your life and no matter what decisions you've made or how successful you are, you come to a point where you say, how did I get here? And you have some kind of self-doubt and some kind of those, those movements that go on in his life for maturity. And we that movie, and Hank said that he really identifies with this character about that kind of self-doubt. He says, you know, I doubt myself all the time, and can I do this? What if people find out I'm a fraud and I'm really not as good as they think I am? And this is Tom Hanks saying this. You know, he's won the Academy Award twice and been dozens and dozens of good films. And so you wonder, how can he doubt himself? And yet he does. He says this specifically. I wanted to quote him. He writes this about himself. He says, it's a high wire act that we all walk. There are days when I know that 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to have to deliver some degree of emotional goods on camera. And if I can't do it, that means I'm going to have to fake it. And if I fake it, that means they might catch me faking it. And if they catch me faking it, well, it's doomsday. Now, as I think about that message, I think about what Paul is preaching to the Galatians. And what Paul seems to be saying is that if you buy into this other gospel that includes every iota of the law, eventually, at some point, you're going to have to be faking it. And he says, wouldn't you rather embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ where you can be real, where you can be yourself all the time? Well, it's hard to be myself all the time. And it's hard to be real all the time. That is hard to handle. But it is authentically Christian. Or at least it should be. Amen. I invite us to pray together our prayer of confession. Gracious God, we gather today like the psalmist, declaring that we believe that we have walked in integrity. We also believe that we have walked in faithfulness, avoided hypocrites, and shunned the company of evildoers. We declare to you all of the good things that we remember doing and saying and believing all week. But just in case our level of integrity is not the same as yours, we, like the psalmist, say, prove us. Place your steadfast love before us again and again and again until we walk in faithfulness to you. Allow us to sit in your presence until we soak up your character and reflect your glory to the world. Prove us, try us, test our hearts and minds until our faith is able to stand sure-footed on solid ground. Then prove us again and again until you are satisfied.
God's grace extends even to those who believe that they have earned it. May we all bask in the grace of God which surpasses our understanding. Amen. And let us affirm our faith in God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Let us share in this faith together. We believe in the Most High God who strengthens us and repays us more times than we expect. We believe in God who gives generously and who expects the same from all of us. We believe in God whose utmost loving sacrifice is experienced through Jesus Christ who gave it all. We believe that Jesus Christ consciously and lovingly emptied himself so that we may learn to sacrifice and live joyfully before God. By Christ's impartial love, we learn to love all those on the margins. We believe in the Holy Spirit who enables us to share the faith of Jesus Christ with the world. We believe that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the church becomes a new community without labels. We believe all has been accomplished for deliverance and salvation and is now being lived in flesh even as God is glorified in heaven. church, I invite you to come forward and meet me here in front of the altar table, and we won't even take a vote. We'll let you come in. Uh, we invite you to come today if you'd like to join us. Let us sing together.